start our program. We would like to request the students who are at the back part of the hall to please move forward. We still have seats here, um, especially for you. So please do come up here um, closer so that we would be able to interact with you more closely. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Before we start, uh, I request all of us to bow our heads for our prayer. Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, please guide us as we start this program, and please also guide us as we sing song praises for you, Lord. And thanks for listening to our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. For our first song, let us sing a scripture song, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded? Ready, sing. Have I not commanded to be strong and of a good courage? Be strong, be strong, and of a good, 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 good courage. Joshua 1. I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. That's where the flowing seas have broken, built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that made the opening song let us all stand and let's sing only trust him on hymn number 279 only trust him
pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what privilege we can be called the daughters and sons of you. Lord, today we gathered here for the special study. We invite your Holy Spirit present and be with us. Open our hearts so we can understand your word. But more important, give us the strength, the strength so we can apply this into our daily life. Equip us and train us to be qualified and be your instrument in the future. Bless the study. Continue to be with us. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Good morning, everyone. And we are so blessed that we have this kind of activity for us to be empowered and to be equipped in the mission field. And God permitted that His chosen messenger today to, to bless us with these learnings and insights. And for now, we are asking that you may please lend your ears and eyes so that we could uh, receive a message from heavens above. And my part is to welcome all of you. Well, good morning, AUPNs. And good morning also our dear faculties. And good morning for our uh, family that here for us to be, uh, for, for them to be served ours. And now, the song leaders are Sister Angel Hipa, Sister Dorothy Claire De La Rosa, and Sister Talia May Bornalil. Yeah, they are first year students from the College of Theology. And our opening prayer was rendered by Brother David Zhao, a third year uh, theology student also. And, well, our message in song will be uh, delivered by Brother Reynal Mandaing, Sister Chloe Bacchus, and Princess Sanchez. So they call themselves as the, the CPR. Okay? And... I want to introduce to you the, the chosen messenger of God. Perhaps they are permitted to go here in AUP for, to deliver what God wants us to receive for this hour. And we are so privileged that Mr. Yip Kokto and Mom Roxana Tang, they are the one who will deliver the theme of God's love in the 70 times 7 and 2300 and authentic encounter of God. If you may, that I will introduce them to you, Mr. Yip Kokto is a retired chartered accountant, finance directorship of regional multinationals located in Singapore, speaks internationally contrasting Eastern and ver versus Biblical meditation. 30 years studying Bible prophecy, Bible study, health, and gardening. On the other, on the other hand, Mom Roxana Tang, piano teacher for 40 years, author of seven piano books entitled Remembered Your Creator, available in many countries. Bible study, Zoom exercise with ladies on Zoom three times a week, cooking and gardening as hobbies. So, without further ado, please, your undivided attention, we are asking.
Good morning, students. We're so privileged to be here to be able to speak to you all. I wish I was young again like you all, once again. So much energy, so much youth, so much future. Now, uh, the reason we're up here is because we're going to use a whiteboard. And the reason you see this whiteboard is because my wife and I have been teaching prophecy. And we had used, you know, just typically read the Bible and talk around the Bible over a table. We had used Zoom, but using Zoom and talking prophecy, when you show 30 slides, by the time you're in the 10th slide, the people have forgotten the first one. But when you start with a whiteboard, blank, and you start drawing it, the prophecies, you see it developing. And by the time this whiteboard is full, the prophecy is there for everyone. And people can stop us and ask questions. Okay? So, today we're going to show you Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks, and the 2,300. And so, for those who are sitting behind, and you ha will have difficulty seeing this, I would inv invite you to come forward because we're teaching a method. Okay? I know you are theology students and you know all about 70 weeks and 2,300, but we are teaching how to proceed with it on the whiteboard. So please, I want to invite as many of the ones behind to come forward. And then what happens is this. It works so well that Bibles, uh, uh, non-SDAs love it. Right? Because for the first time they say to us, oh, I can see where, where to look. In other words, as you proceed to draw, they can follow your hand. And they can stop you and ask questions. And it's really easy. We start with the 70 weeks. Five verses. Okay? All right, so please, come forward. I'm so glad to see you all moving. Come on. Those guys at the back, your eyesight must be very good. <laughs> okay, let's uh, get started. Daniel 9, chapter 9, the 70 weeks, okay? We will only deal with a few of the verses later, but the story begins. Israel and Jerusalem were not obedient to God. And so God sent Jerusalem's enemy, Israel's enemy, Babylon, to conquer and to destroy Jerusalem. Now Daniel was obedient. His friends were obedient, but the rest were not. And so when Jerusalem fell, they all suffered. But Daniel, his heart was still for his people. That's true love. And in Daniel chapter 9, he began to pray to God. He's in Babylon now. And he began to pray. And I want my wife to read a few verses, and you follow it in your Bible. A few verses to reveal to you Daniel's heart for his people. Because this is a loving message. Now, the other thing I forgot to tell you is this. Most people think prophecy is doom and gloom. Frightening. Darkness. Hard to understand. So we want to break that thought, that aversion, the fear of prophecy. Because in Daniel chapter 9, the 70-week prophecy, we will show you 10 embedded messages of love of God for us all. 10. 
Okay? So if we, uh, as we proceed, look out for the embedded messages. And when you see it, most people, in fact, all people would love this message. Okay, so, it begins. 587 BC, Jerusalem fell. Daniel was captured. He was castrated. But his heart for, was for his people and for Jerusalem. So he's praying, praying to understand, to know God's will for his people and his city. All right, this is what we hear in chapter 9. Are you going to read some verses? We're going to read Daniel 9, starting with verse 4, and we'll skip certain verses. So follow along, please. Daniel 9, verse 4. Daniel says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and that to them that keep his commandments. Verse 5. We have sinned, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts, and from thy judgments. 6. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. I skip now to 10. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yeah, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yeah, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am come now to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So Gabriel came to give Daniel understanding. All right, so Gabriel, what's Gabriel's then message to Daniel? And it's all in verse 24, 25, 26, 27. And all we have to do is deal with the prophecy of these four or five verses. Okay? All right. Keep your hand there, and we'll go through it. So what's the first thing that we read in verse 24? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, so how long is given to God's people, his city and Jerusalem and his people. 70 weeks. Okay? Now, 70 weeks to do what? To put an end to sin. To bring in everlasting righteousness and to anoint the most holy. Now, as you study prophecy, you will know that a lot of people say the most holy, in this case, is to anoint the temple. But let's read the next verse to discover who the most holy or what the most holy is. The next verse, Daniel 9. 
verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So 70 weeks unto who? Messiah, the Prince. So who are we to, who were they to anoint? Messiah, the Prince. Okay, so we've got this. Ah, my wife is way ahead of me. <laughs> okay, 70 weeks. All right, how long is 70 weeks? How many years? How many years is 70 weeks? One point four years. Okay. Now, so we we are studying Daniel nine. Seventy weeks, which is only one and a half years. Now, we are talking about a prophecy. Five hundred eighty-seven BC, before Christ. BC, not before COVID. Before Christ. All right. So how many years will this prophecy take to fulfill, to anoint the Messiah? About 500 years, right? So 70 weeks is too short. How do you make 70 weeks into about 500 years? Okay, now the formula is this. 70 weeks times 7 days in 1 week equals 490 days which to make this 490 days fit like 500 years you must take one day for one year you must right but the bible also tells you give you the reason to convert 490 days into 490 years there are two verses in Numbers 14.34 Numbers 14.34 34 It reads, After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Another one, Ezekiel 4, 6, right? Ezekiel 4, 6, at the end of it, it has this verse that says, at the end of it, it says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. All right, so the Bible proof is there. The physical, logical proof is there. One day, one year. Inescapable. So that All was right. during the time of the spies. Remember the 12 spies went to spy out the land? For 40 days, they spied out the land, but 10 out of the 12 spies did not believe that God can help them to conquer. Only two believed. And so God said, okay, 40 days, you have spied out the land. Now you shall be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, one day for a year. What about Ezekiel? We've done with Ezekiel. All right. Now, look at verse 25 again. Now it says, of this time period of 70 weeks, God is splitting it in verse 25. There shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and then the streets will be built again. All right. Why is the 70 weeks this whole period of 70 weeks, which is 490 years, split in verse 26 into 7 weeks, 62, and 7 plus 62 is what? 69. How many weeks are left? 1. 70 minus 69. One week is left. Okay, now, we want you to consider 
the love of God in just these two verses. All right? And I'm sure you know what is where in the Bible and how is 70 times 7? What does it mean? Perfect forgiveness. All right? When did Jesus say that? He said that here when he walked the earth. But he is referring to this prophecy which happened here 500 years ago. So Jesus is referring 70 times 7. He's referring to a prophecy of love and forgiveness for Israel which had sinned and was destroyed. Okay? Now, so let's mark it. Mark this 70 times 7 as a love prophecy. Okay? Now when you ask your friends, all your Christian friends, what it is, they will all know, 70 times 7. But who spoke it? Jesus Christ. And he was referring to a prophecy that we are studying now that was 500 years ago for the forgiveness of Israel. His, his forgiveness of Israel is perfect. Now, what about this seven weeks? Why did God not just say 490 years, 70 weeks, and then he split it? Why split in the 762 and 1? Okay. Who has heard of the Jubilee? How long is the Jubilee? I'm sure you're saying 50, weeks, uh, 50 years. Right? All right. Let's have a look. How seven weeks is equal to a jubilee. A jubilee, let me mark it out, okay? A jubilee is a period of a period of 49 years, actually. 49 years. If you lost your land here, you lose it here, at the next jubilee, which is also 49 years, you get back your land on the first year of the next jubilee. So how long, when people think of a jubilee, how long do they think it is? They add 49 and 1. They say, jubilee is 50 years. But the Bible says, jubilee is 49 years. Now, what connection has jubilee with this prophecy? God is saying, through Gabriel to Daniel. Daniel, we're not talking about time. We're talking about Jubilee. What is the Jubilee? When you've lost your land, you get it back. Israel has lost Jerusalem. In how many Jubilees will Israel get back their land? 490 or 70 weeks. Seven weeks is a Jubilee. How many Jubilees is this? Ten Jubilees. God is saying to Israel and to Daniel, Daniel, this is a signal for you. In ten Jubilees, if you accept and anoint the Messiah, you will get back the land, Jerusalem, which you lost. Now is that love? To restore completely what was lost. Okay? So, this seven weeks, to convert in Jubilee is 70, seven weeks times seven equals 49 years, which is a Jubilee. Now, if you were a slave and you were given to a household and you served as a slave, do you know you'll be set free on the Jubilee? Israel was a slave of sin. And they will be set free when the Messiah comes, when they anoint him. Okay? Now, I want to mark again so that you can follow the love of God. The Jubilee is a love of God. And the signal was given here. Jubilee. All right. Now, what else does the Bible say? Let's read. Verse 20. Let's read 
verse 26 now. Daniel 9, 26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Ah. So, after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. This is the three score and two weeks, 62 weeks. It says after, not before, not during, but after the 62 weeks, which is right here, Messiah is cut off. The question is, what is cut off? What does it mean to cut off? Does it mean to kill? Or does it mean to reject? Okay? Now, what happened when Jesus... Now, if you do the math, this is 457 BC. This is 27 AD. And this ends in 34 AD. So, in 27 AD, when the Messiah is cut off, what does it mean? All right. The word cut off has many meanings. So, we will go there and we will give you the reference for cut off. In Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25. Oh, sorry. It's Leviticus 23. 25. Leviticus 25 is the text for the Jubilee. Leviticus 25. Jubilee spoken of as 49 years in verse 8, and then in verse 10 and 11, it talks about the 50th year. Now, for the Jubilee, you will see it in Leviticus 23. It talks about the cutoff in verse 29. Leviticus 20, 20, 23, verse 9. Okay, so in verse 29 of Leviticus 23, it says, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, so the people were cut off, but they were not killed. All right, that's the important thing. Yes, so during the Day of Atonement, they are supposed to afflict their souls and present themselves on the Day of Atonement, and if they don't turn up, they are cut off from their people. It doesn't mean that they were killed, but they were like rejected, eliminated. Now in 27 AD, Jesus announced his messiahship. And this was in Luke 4. 18, 16, 18, 19, all that in Luke 4. So he announced his messiahship, reading from the book of Isaiah. And what happened there? What did the people want to do with him? Yes, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. They wanted to push him off a cliff. That is cutting off. Rejecting him completely. Okay? So, that's what cut off means. It doesn't mean to kill at that point. He was sacrificed later. Okay? Now, so you see in Luke 4, verse 16, it says here, And he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And it was written in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. So Jesus was reading there in here, verse 18 of Luke 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So here Jesus, he read, 
he's, he read from Isaiah. And in 418, it records him saying to the people, I've come to preach the Jubilee, to set you free. I've come to preach the Jubilee, not just with words, but I've come to preach it with my life. So, after many Jubilees, and this is the 10th Jubilee, Jesus began to offer himself as the Messiah. Now, what does the next verse say about him? Let's read the next verse. The next verse, Daniel 9. In, the in Daniel 9, verse 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So, in the midst of the week, the last week, the last seven years, he was crucified. He caused oblation and sacrifice to cease. He was the Lamb of God. All right, now, let's look at how much love there is so far in this prophecy. So, we studied 70 times 7, the first major love sign. That it is not just 490 years, it is jubilee to set Israel free. And when he offered himself as the Messiah, you know, Jesus knew they would crucify him. And yet, very humbly, he offered himself knowing he will be rejected. Have you had the experience, maybe in the future perhaps, when you may offer yourself, maybe better still, when you are thinking of marrying someone and you offer yourself as a husband and then you know that you will be rejected? You know how humbling it is? That was what happened here. Jesus went, offered himself. And knowing he'll be rejected, knowing he'll be crucified. But if you truly love somebody, your future wife, you would offer yourself. Would you marry me? Right? So it is a love from the heart, deep from the heart, to offer himself. And of course, this is a big big one. He was crucified. Now, this one week is seven years. So there's three and a half years here. Ah, my pen is going dry. So there's three and a half years here and three and a half years here. Three and a half years after the crucifixion. What is the significance of the three and a half years after the crucifixion? Oh, God is saying to Israel, Though you slay my son, I am giving Israel another three and a half years to accept his sacrifice. That is the magnanimity, the deep, long-suffering, in unmeasurable, incomparable, infinite love of God. Another three and a half years. So, I want to add another half. Okay? So let's keep counting. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Okay, now when we started to study with our friends, non-SDA, they love this prophecy because it's all about the grace of God. And a lot of people think, oh, new covenant is all grace. Old covenant is all law. Is that true? Is this all law? A lot of grace. Five hearts already. We're going to show you another five. Ten in total. 
Okay? All right. At this stage, we're going to talk about double profits. To every important event of judgment in the Bible, God does not send just one prophet. He always sends at least two prophets, one to announce the judgment and one to fulfill it. So one will initiate and tell that the judgment is coming. Can you tell me which is the first major judgment in the Bible? Okay, Noah's time? There's a flood, right? Okay, so do you know that Enoch was the first one to announce the judgment? What did he do to announce the judgment? What did Enoch do to announce the judgment? He named his son Methuselah. And what does Methuselah mean? The flood is coming. It means when he dies, when Methuselah dies, the judgment of God, the flood will come. And that's why Methuselah lived for how long? The longest life ever lived, 969 years. He was still living, 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 living. And when he died, on that same year that he died, what happened? The flood actually came. But do you know that when Enoch announced that the judgment will come. That's almost a thousand years later. But when the flood was about to come, God sent another prophet. And who is that? Noah. How long did he preach? Yes. But he was the second prophet to say, get into the ark. The judgment is coming. The rain is coming. God is going to destroy this earth. So God sent how many prophets? Two prophets. Just as he sent two witnesses to always say, you know, you must have at least two or three witnesses before you stone somebody to death, right? So here, God was going to destroy the earth. He sent his prophets. No excuse for them not to know. Correct? Now, then came Abraham. And God told Abraham this time that his descendants will be in a foreign land and it will be for 400 years that they will be there and thereafter, God will judge that land. And what land is that? Egypt. And you know the story. God sent another prophet at the time of the Exodus. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Egypt was destroyed or pretty much devastated. Okay. But the children of Israel were not faithful to God. For 800 years, they have gone after idols, other gods. And so God sent Jeremiah. And Jeremiah the prophet told the people that they will be in Babylonian captivity for how long? 70 years. And towards the end of the 70 years, you heard the prayer that I was reading just now in Daniel 9. Daniel was praying because the 70 years was up and he was crying to the Lord, oh, forgive Israel, forgive all people, defer not, right? And so when Jeremiah prayed, I mean, Daniel prayed, God sent Gabriel and gave him more prophecy, of which the 70 weeks prophecy is one of them, right? The 70 weeks prophecy had many timelines. And at the end of the 62 weeks, we have another prophet. Do you know who that is? The one who baptized Jesus was? John the Baptist. He was a prophet, isn't he? Yes. So, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. He also pronounced judgment, right? The kingdom of God is at hand, and he pronounced judgment to people like Herod and so forth. All right. Then we have Jesus. Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. At that time, he was here a sacrifice, like a prophet also, because Remember in Genesis 3.15, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your seed and her seed. What will the seed of the serpent do? It will only bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And here you have the fulfillment of that prophecy. First, 
never given. And you have this prophecy fulfilled by Jesus here. When he laid down his life as a perfect sacrifice, crushing the serpent's head. And then we have another prophet here at the end of the 70 weeks. Anyone knows who that is? Stephen. Now, you may say, but Stephen is only a deacon. Well, let's take a look. If you turn your Bibles to Acts, chapter 6, verse 8. You will see it says here, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So here you have Stephen, full of faith and power, working wondrous miracles. And verse 15 tells us that his face shone like the face of an angel. And you know, the Sanhedrin Council of Jerusalem, they took Stephen and they tried him. And Stephen uh, recounted the history of Israel. And what did they do to Stephen? They stoned him. They stoned him to death. They don't want to hear what he has to say. But before he died, he looked up and he saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you think Stephen is a prophet? Yes. Do you think Stephen is a prophet? Yes. He fulfilled the important end of the 70 weeks prophecy. This is a very important, significant point of time, which many churches don't talk about it. Why? They only see Stephen as an insignificant deacon. But here ends this end of the 70 weeks that was determined for Israel and the holy city. How do we know that? Remember when in Acts 1 verse 8, in Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said, but you shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall receive, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Now we see this being fulfilled in that order right at this point of time. Now if you turn to Acts chapter 8 now, you will see that because when Stephen was stoned, Saul and other people were persecuting the followers of Christ, they fled. Acts 8 verse 1 says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Right? So you have these believers. Now, they are not in Jerusalem anymore. They were fearful of their lives. They went to Jerusalem. Uh, they went to Judea. They went to Samaria. And they brought the gospel with them. Verse 4 says, they were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. And verse 5 talks about Samaria. Verse 9 talks about Samaria. And you see the people talking, going according to Jesus' commanded from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And now Saul became Paul in the next chapter and brought the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world, to the Gentiles, to you and I. Can you see the order? It fulfills and confirms that this 70 weeks prophecy ended here right at the stoning of Stephen's death. Uh, why is that so significant? Because the stoning of Stephen showed that they would have stoned Jesus or they would have still killed Jesus if Jesus was still alive for them to kill. They have continued to reject the Messiah even though they were given this extra three and a half years to repent and to realize that this is indeed the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. So, in every major act of God, in every major judgment of God, He sends not only one, but two prophets. And in this prophecy, we saw Daniel at the beginning, and we see John the Baptist, Jesus, and Stephen at the very end. 
To send two prophets is the mercy of God. To make sure that people understand what will happen, understand the will of God. Okay? So let's count the blessings again. The love messages. Number one, 70 times 7. Number two, Jubilee. To, to, re, to reinstate to Israel what they deserve. If they anoint the most holy. That's number two. Number three, he offers himself in humility. Number four, he offers himself as the Lamb of God. Number five, God offers another three and a half years. Though you slay my son. And God, in relation to every major prophecy, oh, okay, in relation to every major event, every major judgment, he sends double prophets. Now, not only that, he sends minor prophets. How many minor prophets did he send for Israel? Can you all, theology students, tell me? Where are you, my wife? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you turn to your Bible navigation and you take a look at the, the minor prophets after Daniel, you will see quite a number of minor prophets. Let's count how many there are. Let's see whether your fingers are enough to count them, okay? Are you ready? I'm going to go real fast. So, after Daniel, you have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. How many is that? Twelve, yes. Now, what does twelve remind you of? The twelve tribes of Israel, right? That's what the twelve disciples and apostles represent, the twelve tribes of Israel. Doesn't that tell you how God is concerned about his people? Every one of the tribes, and that includes every one of us. His great love is for us to repent. Because if you read the mind of prophets, you will see that God constantly compels his people, urge them to repent. So God is so thorough in relation to Israel as he is as thorough in our salvation. That is our God. Okay? Now, let's put another big love sign here. Twelve minor prophets. How many have we got now? Four, five, six, seven. Let's not forget this. God is long-suffering. This is ten jubilees. Okay? Long-suffering. Prophet after prophet after prophet. So this will be eight. Ah, okay. We're up to eight. We've got two more to go. There's a countdown. Okay. Now I want to ask you this. Out of every major event, every major judgment, what does God do? In the flood, He pulls out. How many? Out of Egypt, He pulls out Israel. But the first generation didn't make it. But nonetheless, He pulled out Israel. Out of this prophecy, who did he pull out? Who are these? The Bible says, in the words of Paul, it's the one new man in Christ. Because of the cross. Are we the one new man in Christ? Yes. One new man in Christ is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay? No difference. Neither male nor female. And to nurture that one new man in Christ, what happens? From here, in Re the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and 3, God pulls out church number 1. God pulls out church number 2, church number 3. Church number four, church number five, church number six, church number seven. And that's where we are. So, the story continues. The story continues with power after the cross. Where do you think we are? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We are at the end, right? 
Jesus is coming soon. Now, let's consider this a bit more. The one new man in Christ is generation after generation, prophet after prophet, and a prophetic message which our church has for the time of the end. Now, is the act of God in developing seven churches and pulling it out with a message for Laodicea, the church that thinks it is everything and it is not blind and wretched. That it is lukewarm, but they don't think they are lukewarm. They think they are hot. And God said, if you remain in lukewarmness, I will spit you out, reject you. Is that judgment to be spat out? Yes. So, Laodicea is a people judge. But God is still at that point knocking on the door of their heart. Buy of me gold, buy of me a white raiment. Open your heart. So God is merciful right till the end. But the point I want to make is this. The one new man in Christ is pulled out for a purpose that Laodicea may not be Laodicea. That Laodicea may announce the judgment. Now which church announces the judgment? Which church talks about the heavenly sanctuary? Philadelphia, the sixth church. Philadelphia. Philadelphia talks about the heavenly sanctuary, that Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, that he is the only one, the Philadelphian message, he is the only one in the heavenly sanctuary, he's the high priest, and he is the one who can open the door, and he's the one that has the ability also to shut it. Now what does that mean for us? It means the Philadelphian message for the time of the end talks about a heavenly sanctuary where there is a door between the holy place and the most holy. And this church talks about Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. He can open that door and he can shut it. Now, what is in the holy place? What ministry is in the holy place? Forgiveness, mediation, sanctification. That is going on. But in 1844, that door was open. Now, when the door is open, what happens? There is still forgiveness, but judgment is being prepared. There is forgiveness and judgment is being prepared. Now, when he closes the door, what happens? No more this ministry, only this one. Judgment. So, a people judge, a church that's given the message of the time of the end. Now, it may say, whoa, this is serious. This doesn't sound like, oh, the eight signs of love. Right? But let's consider it, okay? Let's think about it. Now, remember, what happened after they rejected Christ? In 70 AD, what happened? Jerusalem fell again. It fell here, and it fell again in 70 AD. Somewhere here. Let's call it here. 70 AD. Now, did Jesus warn them about 70, 80? Did he say, flee? Don't even come back and bring your things. If you're in the field, don't come back for your clothes. Flee. When you see the abomination of desolation comes, flee. Now, when the people heard it, understand that a lot of people rejected Christ for who he really is. But the ones who believed his words, before 70 AD, way before, 
they fled to a place called Pella and lived there and survived. Closer to 70 AD, much closer. In fact, probably in that year. When the Roman armies came, they did not immediately surround Jerusalem. There was plans made, there was retreat, and when they, those who believed in Christ and listened to his words, they fled in the very nick of time, and they lived. So it's 70 AD. In 70 AD, if they believed in Christ, they all lived. In other words, the lesson for us is believe in him, believe in his word, believe in his prophecy. When judgment comes, listen to the Philadelphian message of the open and shut door. Judgment is coming, but it is a message of love and preparation. So, did 70 AD then negate all these eight signs of love? Or was it a message of love and mercy? Listen and believe and live. So even 70 AD is a love message. Okay? Now, I've lost count. Where were we? Number This is 9, Pella. Oh, oh, this is 9 and that's 10. Okay. So I want to say that OMC is 9 and Pella. And Pella is 10. Okay? Pella is 10. So what I'm trying to say to you is when we, sh when we share this with our friends, particularly non-SDAs, when they see the love of God in a one prophecy in four or five verses, what we do is at the end, my wife and I, we sit around a table and it's not a big white board. It's a table with maybe eight people, ten people, and with a piece of paper this size. And this is all that. And then at the end, I draw a big heart. And I said, as I studied this prophecy, it has uh, opened my heart to the love of God. And I'm sure you feel that way. So I will invite you, the ones around the table, like I do, I sign my, my name in the heart, that we are all united as one with Christ. In love, in his mercy, in his promises, in his blessings. And then I hand my pen to anyone who wants to draw and sign their name in the heart. And all of them invariably will sign their name. Yeah? A, B, C, D, E. And then last of all, I will hand my pen to my wife. Because if I had signed myself as gift and then handed it to her, it would put pressure on them, right? They feel that they need to sign. But when I invite them to sign, and they all sign first, and then I hand it to her, and she signs, then we are all united in Christ. We are the one new man. We are on this journey together. We are at the last day. But I invite them to listen to the Philadelphian message, to the open and shut door. And we go there and we study again. Now I want to say this to you. Seventh-day Adventists, we have the Philadelphian message. Amen. We are raised at a time by God, a, a time in 1844, before Laodicean judgment. We are raised with a message, the three angels message. And whoever you are, you may be an, you may be an Adventist. I don't know if there may be people here who are non SDAs. They may be Methodists and uh, uh, Anglicans. Whatever church you are, particularly Seventh-day Adventists, we all, all, including other denominations, should be Philadelphians, should understand the Philadelphian message and give the Philadelphian teaching 
of love. That God is merciful and that He means well. He wants to give life, His kind of life, for His people. But we must not be lukewarm. If not, we will receive the judgment of God who will spit out those who are lukewarm. Isn't that a form of judgment? Indeed. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Now we have actually entitled today's topic God's love in the 70 times 7 and we actually have the 2300 but since um, Sir David is here the 2300 will have to wait all right the 2300 is here right it starts from the same timeline 457 BC and it goes all the way to 1844 and do we expect a fulfilling prophet at that time if we have Daniel as the initiating prophet that announced the 2300, do you think God would give us another prophet there to confirm that his judgment is coming? Yes, yes. and who is that prophet? Alan G. White. Mrs. Alan G. White has been sent for you and I, and now that she is gone and she has left her legacy with all the books, we are to the prophets, we are to be the priests of God to go out to the world to give the three angels' message. Fear God, for the hour of his judgment has come. Give glory to him, he who makes all the heaven, the sea, and the fountains of waters. We are to echo his message and give the warning of judgment to all the world. Now, uh, our speaker is here, David Tan is here. So as he's preparing, are there any questions for us? Any questions? Honey, would you take the question? Who has a question? Are we finished or are we continuing? Is there a part two? Are we what? Are we finished or are we continuing? Is there a part two? <laughs> I wish we could continue, but we have to no, we're not pause here. Uh, David is here. Right, David is here. So, mm. I, I don't know what your schedule is, all right? But we are here for quite a while, and if there's time that is not taking up David's time, we will be happy to regroup with you. Are you so, having anything this afternoon for the theology students? You have your classes, right? For those of you who do not have your classes... You organize it and let us know. Yeah, tell okay. us where you want to meet us, because and we, we will come to you in the afternoon, and we can show we you. We have the lots. What happens is with uh, our groups, we go on and on. We go down to 2,300. We go down to the seven churches. We go down to um, uh, Israel prophecy, yeah, and so forth and so forth. And so we put a picture together that every piece fits, and uh, non-SDAs really appreciate Seventh-day Adventist way, the framework of prophecy that is so established. So I leave it to you to organize it. Let us know. We are free. Okay? Uh, we appreciate very much, sir and ma'am. Uh, we would like to know whether you have a material regarding this, uh, written material or... Written material. Yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, PowerPoints on YouTube. All right. But it's not as good as drawing it on a board. Okay? Yes. We have this as the foundation, really. This really is a foundation for the false, uh, to, to, for against the false prophecies. We do not have time right now, but really, the false prophecies has broken up this prophecy. And so... If we have time with you, we will really like to develop it further to show you how the false prophecies have twisted this prophecy. Yes. The Bible presents Christ as our foundation. Right? And this prophecy pre presents Christ as the foundation of the 2300. In fact, in the English language, vision or prophecy as one word, vision. But in the original language, this 
490 year prophecy is called Mare. Mare is not just information when it starts, when it ends. Mare is the prophecy, the vision of revealing the man Jesus Christ. Now, you, you have studied Revelation. The first chapter reveals Christ. And the whole of Revelation is a lot of information. But the foundation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is a foundational prophecy. And when you get it, people will love Christ, people will love the way you look at prophecy, and it will open a door for you to enter, to speak with them. Okay? So, I'm, anything else? All right. Shall we bow our heads? Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Father, that you have given us your love, even in the prophecies, that we can see how much you care for us. Oh Lord, you have said that we are to understand what the abomination of desolation is. We are to understand what the 70 times 7 means when it reflects your perfect love and forgiveness. Oh, Father, we want to humble ourselves to you this morning to ask you for whatever forgiveness we need so that our prayers may reach you, that our sins may be forgiven, that we may be found faithful to you as your greatly beloved, like Daniel. I pray for all these theology students here, whether freshmen or seniors, we pray, Lord, that you will cover them that you will be with them, that you will give them the wisdom, that you will help them as they study, as they discover your truths in the Bible. May it touch their hearts in such a way that they will be so overflowing with your fountain of love that they will share your message, your gospel, even your warnings and your prophecies to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, beginning with our people in the family. So we pray for all here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless. Hello. You can go for five minutes break, come back if you need to. While we are trying to figure out how to do the PowerPoint. Can someone help to remove this to the side, the whiteboard? Okay, um, while Sir David is doing the PowerPoints, I'd like to announce that on Monday at the Pillar Building, at the music department, I, having been teaching piano for 40 years, will be presenting my books there, and they are entitled, Remember Your Creator. And you know, in Ecclesiastes 12, 1, it says, Remember Your Creator in the days of your youth. So these are piano lesson books, meant for children as well as retirees, whatever their age, teenagers, adults, to allow them to use Christian songs to learn piano rather than all the um, uh, uh, secular songs that are about animals rather than about God. So, anybody here interested in music? Anybody here loves music? Okay, all right. <laughs> I saw your hand first. I'm going to present this book free of charge to you. And, all right, you can share the blessing with all of us, all, all your friends. Okay, can someone take a picture for me, please? My name is Peter. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Are we ready to come back? Testing. Testing, testing.
few, a few.
Only 11 million. What is the population of Philippines? 110 million. Do you think within this group we can finish the work proclaiming the gospel of Jesus coming and salvation to all nations in the Philippines, to the only Philippines within your generation? With this spirit, yes. With this spirit, of course. One only. The rest of you don't think so. No wonder we have been around for 170 years. You're not here. So, you are the elite of Philippines for theology, am I correct? Yes? Theology students. How many of you are theology students? Raise your hand. So many. But yet just one person say, within your generation, you can finish God's work of spreading the gospel to Philippines. 110 million people. You don't think so? Would you like to know how? Would you like to know how? Can you understand my language? Yes. I'm speaking Singlish, yeah? Not Filipino. Okay. Ah. So all, all of you can raise your hand if you can understand what I'm saying. I want you to be very responsive. That means react. So I, I know whether you are sleeping or daydreaming or actually listening. So let me ask the question again. How many of you think you can finish spreading the gospel within this group only, huh? To 110 million people in Philippines. Raise your hand. Uh, only half of you. The other half don't think so. What if I make it even closer within, within five years? Five years? Within five years. Raise your hand, hi, hi. Oh. Only within five years. Only one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. What if within one year? One. Come forward. <laughs> one brave soul, say within one year. Can you tell us how you think you can be done? Louder, louder. When, when the apostles were there in the day of atonement or the day of Pentecost, one of the, what are the two days? Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, they prayed for the Holy Spirit and then everybody started speaking in the same tongue that went up. And thousands upon thousands were added to the church in one day. So I think it's possible in, in just one year if we just stay faithful to God. Thank you, thank you. With the power of the Holy Spirit, let the rain, huh? Okay, very good. Do you know, Pope, this was uh, more than 10 years ago, nine years ago, 2024, 10 years ago, he went to Spain and he says no one should work on when? Oh, that was 10 years ago. Sunday negatively impact the family and friendship. Pope Francis urges not working on Sunday. Waste time with your with your children. Here's another one. This is a different occasion. How many of you know about Martin Luther? What is he famous for? What is he famous for? Nailing the 95 pieces in the front of the church, cathedral. So, 500 years later, the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church wants to celebrate 
Do you think Ruthen will be happy? Want to celebrate that we are now friends, we are no, en no more enemy. Do you think Ru Martin Luther will ha be happy? Who say yes? Who say yes? <laughs> ah, if he is alive, he will be very sad. But that's what they did. 500 years, the Catholic Church used this occasion to, to, to uh, say, we are no longer, you, you, you should no longer protest. We are all friends, we are all Christians. Don't protest. How many of you agree with this philosophy? No? Nobody? And this good? Yeah? Another similar, for similar occasion. Pope Francis 2027, Catholic world commemorate 500 years of reformation. Serious or not? You know what that means or not? In 2017, Catholic will commemorate 500 years of reformation. Do you understand this? Theology students? What does this mean? Anybody want to attempt? No? What about cocktail? What does this mean? I, it means that they are saying that they have reformed the Christian world, that they are the, the leaders in, in evangelism, in uniting the world. Mm. No reason why you should protest anymore. He goes on to say, Someone likes to read this? Pope says it's the devil who divides Protestants and Catholics. What do you think? Agree? No? How many of you don't agree? Many people are sitting on the fence. Eh? You are theology students. Make decision. Are theology students supposed to be leaders? Yes or no? Yeah, you're supposed to lead your flock. You're the shepherd, going to be the shepherd. So, shepherd has to make the right decision. So, is this right or is this wrong? No. The devil is dividing you and the Catholic Church. How many of you think? The devil is dividing you and the church, and, and the Catholic Church. That means the Seventh-day Adventists included, huh? The devil is dividing the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Catholic. How many of you agree with this statement by, the, by Pope Francis? Raise your hand. Nobody? How many of you disagree with this statement? Raise your hand. Again, many are sitting on the fence. Terrible. You're the elite Seventh-day Adventist school for theology. Am I correct? Oh, I hope so. You are the one who will be graduating, not me. <laughs> the devil knows... What does it say? The devil knows the Christians are one, says Pope Francis. Agree? Now, what... You know Pope Francis is very into climate change, right? Agree? Yes. Are you keeping track? Yes. What does he say about climate change? That you're not giving a one day of rest to the earth, to Mother Earth. You're not giving one day of rest to Mother Earth. You remember COVID? How many days of rest did the Mother Earth has? COVID? Many months, many years, right? One, two years, shut down. Nothing goes on. So the environment was uh, back to perfect. So Pope Francis says, what does it say? 
climate change, he calls for urgent action that we should spend at least one day in a week not working. Let the Mother Earth rest. Which day do you think he is promoting? Are you sure? And what is it called? What is it called? Louder, louder. What is it called? He will not say Sunday law. Okay. What day is it called? Huh? What does he call Sunday? No. Yeah, Sabbath. What Sabbath? Green Sabbath. Green Sabbath. I think it's called Green Sabbath. Green Sabbath. This is for those who don't are not Christians, those who are ethnic uh, and uh, don't believe in any religion. At least you believe the environment is having problems. So you need at least one day. Everybody agree. And what do you, what day would that be? Naturally, Sunday because it's a holiday. Okay, let's read. Turn to your Bible. Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. Turn to your Bible. And I hope you all take notes. Eh? I hope you all will take notes. Let's read it all together. Are you ready? Matthew Chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. Read it out loud together. Oh! Confusion. You are speaking in tongues. <laughs> okay, I don't understand. Let's be uniform. Huh? Who wants to lead? You. You lead. Okay, let's read in unison. Amen. You believe this is your commission? Future pastors, Bible workers, yes? What does it say? He, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All powers, how much power? All power, all heavenly power is given unto who? Jesus in heaven and earth. That means the power of heaven and power of earth is given to who? Louder, louder. Jesus. Yes. After, this, after Jesus resurrected, he went to heaven, he received his power from God the Father. And after that, he says, Go ye therefore and teach how many nations? All. all except Philippines. No? All except China. No. Africa? We are from Africa. Go ye... What? All, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, your purpose is to be able to win some for God, right? Baptizing them. When you're baptizing them, you say bye-bye. Is that correct? You can go your way now. You are safe. Yes? No? What must you do next? Teaching them to observe how much things? How much things? 
all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What is the end of the world in Philippines? Which place you don't like to go? Any place you don't like to go? Can you name one in Philippines? Huh? Huh? Louder, louder. Where was it? Silana. No. Which place you don't like to go? There are many places, right? You like to be comfortable. Go to the, be the pastor of the big churches. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you. God says, if you do my work, I am with you. Always, even unto the end of the world. Amen? Amen. So, every day you should claim this promise. As Seventh-day Adventists, what is our great commission? Anybody knows? What is the message that nobody else can, can share? Three angels' message. How many of you can recite three angels' message without looking at the Bible? One. Who is that? Oh, can you come forward and recite? Ah, I met you before. What's your name? Mark Jacob. Mark Jacob. Yes. Okay, face then. All right. All of you turn to Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every tongue, nation, kindred, and people. Verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Then another angel followed them, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that made all the nations drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which poured out full mixture without, um, without, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and they have no rest day and night who worship the beast in his image and receive the mark on his forehead and in his hand. I think that's it. Mark. Yes, very good. Thank you. <laughs> All of you should, theology student, huh? that's your message to the world. You can preach about Jesus lovers and so on, but this is the Great Commission for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Every one of you should understand what this means and how to share it. Okay. Is it a nice message to share? Nice or not? Are you sure it's very nice? Judgment is about judgment. Nice or not? It's about burning. It's about Babylon is falling. Is it nice message? Huh? It is nice if you accept. It is terrible if you don't accept. Correct? So many of many times we as Seventh-day Adventists are fearful to share this because we think it's a terrible message. Whenever you especially in Philippines, huh? Filipino culture. Uh, don't want to offend people, right? Correct? Yes? yes. Ah, you like to be friend-friend with, with everybody. So, this is, remember, this is a wonderful message. If you share and they accept. If they, you share and you don't accept, it's a terrible message. But nevertheless, as a pastor, are you supposed to share? 